let me welcome you once again back to Grace Cafe. It's a pleasure to be with you all again. Um, you can find us here at Grace Cafe on YouTube under Grace Cafe. You can find all of our past wonderful Grace Cafe interviews on the Grace app. Download that free app to your smartphone and you can find us under Grace Cafe there. Um, I want to start this Grace Cafe episode with a question. We have been dealing with a tremendous amount of biblical leadership. We've been talking about it. We've had seminars and conferences about it. Um, and, and a question that's been niggling in the back of my head has been this. Um, our leadership characteristics, our biblical leadership principles and qualities for the everyday man, for the everyday person. Um, my guest today, my good friend, Carlin Charleston, he is a teacher, speaker. He is the leader of an organization called Erased Race, which we're going to get you back on at one point in time and have a conversation about that. Um, he was our con one of our conference workshop speakers. He's been back to do, uh, did a wonderful job of exposing the leadership qualities of Joseph. Um, and we've asked him back on to dive a little bit deeper into that with us. Carlin, so good to see you again, my friend. Thanks for being on Grace Cafe with us. I'm so glad to be here. Good. So kind of let me pose the question once again, throw it out there and ask you this. Um, are biblical leadership principles, biblical leadership characteristics for the everyday person? Yeah, you know, I think we probably should take the uh, biblical part out of it and start talking about leadership and just okay. seeing that it really applies across the board to everybody. Because um, just like Joseph in, in the study of Joseph, Joseph uh, his leadership qualities weren't just seen by his brothers, those people who believed what he believed, those people who came from where he came from. They were seen everywhere when he went up the ladder of success. And sometimes that ladder of success was going down because even when he was in prison, his leadership qualities were seen. They put him in charge of all the prisoners. You know, then when uh, while he was in prison, he was he was working his leadership skills. Those leadership skills are what catapulted him to the leadership positions that he eventually had in Egypt, because the leader of Egypt, most leaders can recognize leadership when they see it. And the leaders in Egypt saw that. And so then he was to the place where his leadership was then appreciated and he was a leader. OK, so here's this guy. He's a he's a the least of the brothers. I mean, he's 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 so the least of the brothers, they basically leave him behind. He he comes out of being sold into slavery. Uh, uh, and I, as you said, leadership recognizes leadership. Um, but the but those principles, the, the character of that leadership had to be instilled. It had to be brought from God. But but I guess let me let me drive this question back to my original question. Um, because we could easily say, oh, well, God didn't give me those leadership skills. But if you believe that everybody has influence, everybody impacts somebody somewhere, if we translate the definition of leadership to that, everybody impacts somebody, everybody mm -hmm. um, uh, um, influences somebody, then we mm -hmm. all have leadership. We all have that as a characteristic, correct? And so correct, so cor so much so correct that you could take the example of the three year old in the in the back seat of the car and you're driving, and it's a summer day, and the three year old says, "Daddy, mommy, can we stop and get some ice cream?" The influence begins there because now they will relate to what this person is saying, and because of the initiation of that one act or thought then it can influence because after all, that's all leadership is, it's influence. And we just make it in this broader spectrum to say that it's influence to get people to go a particular direction. That's what the three-year-old was doing. And you put it out there and, cause you know, people always talk about the bully pulpit and how leadership yeah. is just standing up and saying these things because it is that influence. And so after that influence, then what happens? And then there's action that takes place after that and, and leadership then em employs that influence so that it can make some things happen. But it's just that simple act of influence. And so yes, at every level, someone is trying to influence other people in their lives in various ways. And like I said, the three-year-old and the, and the 30-year-old. I think you've just proven John Maxwell wrote a book called The 360 Degree Leader. And, mm -hmm. and I think you just proved that point. His, the, 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 the final statement in his 360 Degree Leader book was this, you influence 
those above you, those beside you, and those below you. And, I, and I'm not talking in terms of status. I'm talking in terms of your, in, in an organization, who you lead mm -hmm. and who leads you That's right. and who you work alongside with. If a mm -hmm. 360 deleter is correct, then we all ought to be engaged in learning about these principles of leadership that really do come out, especially in people like Joseph. You see them time and time and time again. And I think Joseph proves the point. Here's a guy who was, he was an everyman. He was a basically a nobody. And yet mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. kept placing him in that position and others recognized him. When you gave your, your talk um, on the person of Joseph, Joseph you, you made this statement, uh, good leaders have quirks and that's okay. Good leaders have quirks, and that's okay. Unpack that a little bit more for me. I know you did in your message, and those of you who are watching, you can go back to his message through the Grace Center, Grace Center for Spiritual Development, um, and it's a wonderful message to listen to, but that one really stuck with me. Good leaders have quirks, and that's okay. Unpack that, would you? Yeah, now, it's of course, we just talked about the definition of leadership being influence, and so that's a, a level that everyone has. But in addition to that, we do understand that that concept of leadership that we often talk about professionally is when someone is placed in authority, in positions of authority in in organizations, in, in businesses, in institutions, in churches. And so we're talking about that type of leadership in, in the generic sense. And so those type of people, in order to lead those type of organizations, often God sets them apart some kind of way. Now, we call those things quirks. I mean, that person is strange. Like, And you hear it often, even talking about President Trump, they talk about how he's narcissistic. And, uh, yeah. and when you think about that, well, maybe he is. But, you know, maybe that is his quirk. Maybe that is his thing. And I said, because to become the, uh, the president of the United States, you've, you've got to kind of be into your ability. You've got to be very confident. And so people can characterize that any way that they want to. But often it is those things that people see as being, you know, th that I don't like or that person's kind of strange this way, whatever. That might be the thing that set them apart. And so was the case of Joseph. And Joseph, his was his dreaming capability. He had this thing. He would always dream. He'd go to his brothers and like I said, they rejected him every time. And then they began to make fun of him. You the a dreamer and they you know so that was his quirk but often those quirks are the things that God is going to use to take us up that uh, that success ladder you know and he did that with Joseph that dreaming was his thing and it was the thing that made him successful it, it, it's a fascinating way that you unpack that because here's where I go with that that whole line of thinking um, then instead of God why did you make me this way with this quirk or with these, <laughs> these, these skill sets or these characteristics. Why, why did you make me this way, God? Instead, the shift is, God, I'm grateful that you made me this way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, how, how do you want me to use this quirk? How do you want me to mm -hmm. use this for your, for your glory and for my good? How do you want to, how do you want me to use that? That's, that's a huge uh, transitional shift in terms of how God made you. Um, and we, yes, you're right. because think about that. Yeah, because uh, somebody along the way is going to appreciate that quirk. And that's what I always tell people. I said, you need to live long enough for someone to appreciate your quirks and say, hey, I value that. And that is useful. That is exactly what I need in my organization, in my church, in my family, in my business. That's exactly what I need. So, but yeah, it's, hang it's, on to the least, embrace the quirk, I say. Embrace the quirk. Embrace the quirk. <laughs> <laughs> embrace embrace the, quirk. the quirk. Well. And that brings me to my next question, because it's it, you've also said that good leaders will always face opposition. That could be opposition because of your quirk, but it also could be opposition because what you're bringing to bear in that in that leading, in that influencing may go against somebody else who's working alongside you or above you or below you. That I mean, you're going to face opposition. Um, what kind of opposition inside or outside? You, you said adopt an okay, that's okay attitude. So now we've got, I'm okay with my quirks. I'm also okay with opposition. Help me, help me see that one as well. Oh, oh, because remember now, God's got an ultimate, uh, he's got a plan here that doesn't put you in that position of leadership without you being prepared. So mm -hmm. God is, in the meantime, is doing this training. We're in school, we're going through this training and you don't get trained. And I, I was in the bodybuilding for a long time and you don't get stronger 
by light weights. You get stronger by heavier weights. You get stronger by more resistance. God understands that. God created that principle. And so what he's doing in the meantime is he's bringing that opposition so to strengthen us, to prepare us for the challenges that we will have in those leadership positions. I always say, uh, God makes your haters your facilitators. You know, they're working this process in your life. They're refining you. He And he's actually doing all the work, but he is using these people. And while they might think they're against you, they don't realize they're propelling you. And so we've got to understand that that God is using the, that opposition to strengthen us and prepare us for the leadership to come. Well, then that brings us back to what, the point we just made before. Then instead of looking at the opposition from the standpoint of, God, why have you done this? We need to be changing our focus and, and, maybe, and changing our perspective to, God, you have brought this opposition in front of me. What are you trying to build in me? What are you trying right. to develop in me? G great, great. Oh, just beautiful. I, I really appreciate you unpacking this this way. You, you made this Oh, Joseph is a great also. story. I love that story. <laughs> That's, yeah. I, I really do. When you asked me to do that, I was like, oh, I love Joseph's story. It's, it's a good one. Such a good it. one. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, you also said good leaders serve. Good leaders serve. Now, um, obviously, from a Christian perspective, good leaders recognize that they serve the Lord. But I think you I think you're you're going to state this a little bit more broadly than that. Um, unpack that one a little bit, would you? Yes. So you do. You, of course, have the uh, scriptural imperative, you know, that where in Matthew 25, I think, believe it was he where he said, you know, uh, he was separating the sheep and the goats. And he told the sheep, he said, you did this great thing for me. And they were like, when did we do that? And he said, well, such as you do to the least of these. So it shows that uh, from the, at least the biblical perspective that we have this requirement to serve those fellow human beings around us. And this is the way that we serve. But even in the uh, in the in the real world, in the other world, the, 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 the prince of this world's world, then leaders do the same thing. And you'll notice as, as the higher a person gets in their positions of responsibility, the, the broader than their constituency and so are their followers. And so to mm -hmm. be the ultimate leader means to serve all those. This, the president is, in fact, serving all of the citizens of the United States, trying to meet their needs. And so he's got that responsibility. So ultimately, the, the more the higher you get, the more you need to serve, the more servants you have, you know, more you should be serving, rather, the more you should sure. be serving. And obviously, our ultimate example is Christ, who mm -hmm. served us all by going to the cross mm -hmm. for us. There is the ultimate example of that. But I would ask. Yeah. In, in, yeah. His statement. I mean, think about it. I mean, just from his perspective, he said, I came not to be served, but to serve. And then I, I also uh, liken that scripture to the one that says, you know, the last shall be first and the first shall be last, you know, so the higher you get, the more I, I did one uh, a talk one time said working my way to the top through the bottom, because that's what we're there. To, we're really doing that. That's what we do. We're because of our service. We have to go down to go up. Well, and, and that kind of brings that that whole issue of and, and it's been a buzzword for years and years and years in Christian leadership, servant leadership. But it really mm -hmm. is understanding that all the capability, all the skill sets, all of the talent, all of the, the giftings that I have, and even my placement in this position. And Joseph is the perfect example of this. <laughs> no one could have dreamed that he would have gone from a pit in the, in the bottom of the ground in the desert to second in command mm -hmm. in such a short period of time the humility had to have just been, God, what have you done? And and it could be a huge trap of leaders to not express it the way Joseph did. Because Joseph, he walked a pretty fine tightrope. Um, and that tightrope of, I've got this huge set of responsibilities, but I know where all this gifting and where all this talent, where all this blessing came from. It came from the Lord. Talk a minute just about the necessity of that humility at that at that leadership level. Well, and it goes into some of the things that we've talked about here already. You know, first of all, I know that God has uniquely uh, uh, prepared me for this. He gave me this quirk. He gave me this skill. He gave me this ability. And so when I get there to that place, I'm not there ruling because of my personal abilities. I'm not ruling because of me. 
I'm ruling because God has gifted me for this position. And so as a result of that, then it, it determined the way he ruled. And I guarantee you, the, you know, they chronicled how great this leader Joseph was there in Egypt, you know, and it was because he wasn't ruling in and of his own ability. He had to do this right. thing, which we have to do. And that is we have to trust God. We have to believe that God has prepared us, qualified us and allow him to work through us in the positions where he's placed us because it's an understanding that he put us there, he prepared us, he trained us, and now we're here and we must continue to heed and obey what he is telling us to do. And isn't it fascinating that he not only prepared him, but he placed him in an organization that didn't know God. Mm -hmm. They placed oh, him to I mean, and in, order to, in, in order to be able to unfold it. I, yeah, go ahead. And, and and so much of that is so relevant and pertinent to our lives today. I mean, really is. And that's why I like Grace School of Theology, because you all do that workplace evangelism. Your life is is on display before the world wherever you are. And it doesn't matter. And so and that's the and that is why Joseph is so great, because, yeah. And Joseph didn't say, uh, you know, when he got this, because this is what we kind of do today, which Grace School of Theology is great about changing that mindset, is that Joseph didn't say, wow, God has given me this gift. I'm going to be the head of the biggest church in, in Egypt one day. He didn't say, I'm going to go and just be yeah. a, give this message of God to everybody and tell him about my dreams, whatever. He used that to impact that whole society because he saw the bigger picture that God had because God had a bigger picture than, than he would have had if he had just been concerned about his his quirk. So you got a dream and God has given you this. Don't just live there because God's way bigger than that, too. And Joseph understood that. And we need to understand that. And like I said, I think Grace School of Theology does that and goes, you know, hey, don't leave your job. You could God can use you right there, you know, and he might be yeah. doing that. So we got to understand yeah. that. You know, I think that's also, and I'm just, I'm, I'm going to make an aside break here for just a minute, but I, I think it's a relevant point here. Just in the whole theology of faith and work, we make the mistake when we think kingdom work is only that stuff that's done through the church or only that stuff that mm -hmm. we consider today right. um, 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 sacred ministry. We make a mistake mm -hmm. when we separate sacred and secular personally, right? Um, mm -hmm. because God places us gives us, skills us, and places us in those positions in the workforce, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our hospitals. He, he places us in those positions and gives us specifically to be able to not only work to his glory, because the work itself has value, but mm -hmm. secondarily to say, that's the expansion of the kingdom. They're going to come to know you because of how well you work. Right. If you'll mm -hmm. notice in the, in the story of Joseph, the thing that separated him was how well he organized people, how well he mm -hmm. put them together, mm -hmm. how well he led them. It wasn't that he stood up and he said, let me tell you about God. He got a chance <laughs> right. to tell him about God because mm -hmm. of the sure. value of how he worked. That beautiful right. portrayal of, man, you're doing the work. There's something special about you. Now you've now you've created the, the, the environment in which I can walk into that. Um, I see, and, and frankly, I, I see this in you a lot. Um, it's it is just it's the uh, uh, it's the joy that comes out of you when you speak that makes people want to hear what you have to say. Um, and I think that's a I think it's a gift that God has placed in you uh, that gives you that passion and that that um, that joy speaking about what you mm -hmm. believe. Anyway, and that's what I like about Gray School because when I when I when because that's what I like like you all have given me an opportunity to. To really, you know, I'm doing a race race and I'm going out and I'm reaching everyone and all who will come. The passion that I have for Christ should be exuded in that if I never even mention his name. And that's what I think, yeah. uh, like I said, great school of theology. That's why I love you guys, because, I mean, I can do that. Now, when I come over to great school, I mean, I got that passion and I'm able to talk straight up about Jesus and talk about this <laughs> scripture and how God is saying this and what he's doing. So that's great. And I get that out. But when I go out to the world, then they should see all those things that I believe about him. They should see that whether I bring up his name or not. And so I try to be, I try to be the light rather than saying I am the light. <laughs> I got to be it. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Well, and I mean that whole, that whole old Testament Genesis statement about you were created. You're, you're the image bearer of God. No matter where mm -hmm. you are, you bear his image, whether you're mm -hmm. at the top mm -hmm. of the organization 
the bottom of the organization, the middle of the organization, whether you're in your family, your neighbor, wherever you are, you're still his image bearer, his image representer. Um, mm -hmm. And so how you conduct yourself and how you do that, that's incredibly important. So let me kind of land this plane. We're, we're getting a little short on time here. Let me land, land this plane a little bit with this last statement. Um, good leaders are patient with the process of waiting on God. It's really tough to do, especially with leaders who are challenged with getting a job done, where many, many leaders are task oriented. Um, how does a good leader in, in your idea and your thought process, how does a good leader wait patiently on God? I, I think it's gotta be the issue of faith. It's got to be the issue of faith, um, because first of all, I mean, if you uh, think about the scriptural passage, it says, you know, faith in Hebrews 11, one says faith is the evidence of things not seen. So in other words, I've got to get very un I've got to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. I've got to get comfortable with not having the big picture and knowing it all. So there's got to be this level of trust that. God is in control because if it's if I don't think he is, then I'm going to get eager. I'm going to start anticipating. I'm going to get I'm going to say, let me. That's the story of Abraham. God gave him this thing that's going to happen. But Abraham said, well, hey, well, it's not happening. Let's do. And his wife came along and said, hey, well, maybe we should do this or whatever, because they weren't willing to wait. They weren't willing to wait. And they, you know, so so we got to see that. First of all, you can't rely on the stuff that you see. You've got to believe. And so that's the that's the issue of faith. But the other part of the issue of faith. Faith is uh, uh, further down there in, in Hebrews eleven six, where it says, "Without faith, is impossible to please God." And so, if we understand that uh, at the at the end of that verse, where it talks about, and those who come to Him uh, must believe that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, then we're like, then we're willing to wait because we know at the end of it that God will reward us. And so, I'm willing to wait because I know that God has the reward at the end because I am in fact seeking him. So those things will allow us to wait. So in that process that you're going through, and that's the story of Joseph. Joseph was just so able because Joseph, he had the dream and, and just, and he had to have known this was from God. And so I'm going to wait this thing out. Well, I'm in prison, but I know what God said. So I can wait this thing out. You know, my brother sold me into slavery, but I know what God said. So I can wait this thing out. So yeah. the leader, the, and like I said, we don't have to say biblical leader, but true leaders understand that when they're put there by God, then, and, and, and so I think a re really that is the message. If I was to do a leadership symposium to not, not just Christian leaders, but presidents, I would tell them that you're put there by God, because that's what scripture says. All, all authority is given by God. You're put there by God, whether you know that or not, whether you are a believer or not, you were put there by God. Then it makes them understand they have a responsibility to him. They need to hear from him. They need to wait on him and they can only rule if they do uh, rule according to what he has given. Them. So, yeah, so I can wait because I know it's from God. Well, and that, that presupposes something as well, that a good leader is in relationship with God and is actively seeking. What you said at the end of that Hebrews passage is he, he who del diligently seeks him, um, there is, even in that waiting period, you're still diligently seeking the Lord, waiting on him, waiting to hear from him, waiting for him to say go, waiting for the next step, whatever that might be. Um, beautiful, beautiful statement. Um, and one more point to that. Think about this, Mark. Think about this. I yeah, I wanna ask this question though, you know, because, yeah, the, while they might need to be in a relationship, the uh, king of Egypt was not in a relationship with God, but the testimony of Joseph gives him that opportunity, you know, so think right. about that, you know, and so yeah. he, I would say he was a great leader because he could recognize good leadership and and I would say even specifically godly leadership he knew yeah. what what this what this man brought and he brought it because God gave it to him and he was able to recognize that so if you're a leader you need to and you don't have the relationship with God you at least need to be able to recognize when God is moving in someone and use them well i think that also says uh, I, you know the, the old henry blackaby statement about see where God is working and go join him Join um, means you got to be in tune to where God's working. He's working mm -hmm. all around mm -hmm. you. Am I in tune to that? And am I looking for those opportunities that he's placing me into in order to be able to, to let people know who he is? Uh, 
great discussion. I really thank you, Carlin, for kind of taking us a little bit deeper. Obviously, your heart and your passion for Joseph. Um, for those of you uh, at, uh, here listening have not had a chance to hear um, Carlin kind of unpack the leadership characteristics, the leadership lessons learned from uh, the life of Joseph, you need to go do that through Grace Center for Spiritual Development. Um, we're going to be uploading them hopefully to the Grace app here soon. This was our our biblical leadership extension that we did off the conference. Um, once again, Carlin, I just love talking with you, brother. I really appreciate your time and your effort uh, and, and just your insight. It's a wonderful thing to see. Thank you for being with us. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me. I love anytime Grace School of Theology asks me to do anything, I'm there. So I just want to thank you and I appreciate you all. Thank you, sir. For those of you watching, we thank you for being a part of Grace Cafe today. Um, you can find us again on YouTube under Grace Cafe. You can also pull down the Grace app, that free download to your smartphone, and you can find all of the past Grace Cafes as well as a whole host of other free resources, devotional studies, Bible studies, study guides, our biblical conference that we had, our biblical leadership conference that we had, all of that available to you on the Grace app. We thank you for joining us here on the Grace Cafe. We look forward to seeing you the next time. Appreciate you being with us.